All right, good evening, everyone. Happy Sunday, happy end of your weekend. Um, I'm so grateful that you're all here. Um, we have a powerhouse of women tonight. So this is a first on the Minneapolis Poetry Sanctuary. I'm so excited. Um, we have all new poets tonight. Um, Sue was gonna make it. Um, she's having some technical difficulties, but um, yeah, I'm very excited. So um, just a little bit about Minneapolis Poetry Sanctuary. I started it in June of 2020. Um, it's a project where I wanna connect poets and creative writers from all over the world. Um, I really believe in you know, the inspiration that we get from others and other people's writing. So um, you can check out the Facebook page. I have an Instagram as well. And um, the YouTube page as well is great because if you have people that aren't on Facebook but you want to share, you know, the videos, um, you can check it out at the Minneapolis Poetry Sanctuary YouTube page. Um, and I also encourage people to uh, try to interact on the Facebook page. I some weeks I forget, I forgot this last week, but I try to post a writing prompt every Wednesday. And I will sometimes just ask questions like who's your favorite poet or different things for people to get to know each other. So um, let's get started. And um, Jen Fossenbell, welcome. Tell us about yourself. Hi, thank you. Um, yeah, I'm coming from Denver this evening where I live near Denver. Um, and Colorado is originally where I'm from, but I spent five years in Minneapolis and did my MFA at the U of M. Um, I also lived for um, three years in Hanoi, Vietnam, and three years most recently in uh, Beijing, China, and just returned last year from there. Um, you can find my work if you are so moved. Uh, most recent work in so-and-so poetry, Alluvium, and um, Black Warrior Review. And I um, co-translate poetry for the Spittoon Literary Magazine to um, share contemporary Chinese poetry with English speaking <clears throat> communities. Um, so with that, I'll start. Um, I'm gonna share four pieces um, tonight that all come from a series of poems I wrote either while in Beijing or inspired from my time in Beijing. Um, one of the things I loved there, I was really um, intrigued and often moved actually by the um, language that I often saw on clothing, um, like a lot of it in English or some version of English um, on jackets and sleeves and pants and shoes and everything. Um, so I, I started to collect these phrases and turn them into titles of a whole series of poems, which I'm working on assembling into a chapbook. Um, so the poems I'm sharing tonight all come from that series. <clears throat> and the first one is entitled, We on an Ultra Light Beam, This is a God Dream. Two months into my second and so emotional already, not just the weeping, but the shutter huff thing my dad does when listening to Simon and Garfunkel, such a tiny sound the smallest hurting, like how much the soul can remember, wrapped in the starry womb and kicking in the dark, <clears throat> desperate to go through it. But you are not yet sweet, though you are mine. You are an unripe fruit, lacking character. So far you have only a mass that is your own, a primal cellular intent, your minute need machine thrums near my liver, yet you are mine as much as my body is mine, or not at all. A foreign immigrant in my midst. B said, how weird to have not me inside of me. And it is the most private invasion by invitation, othering through intimacy. We are concentric peoples. <clears throat> you make yourself visible after lunch if anyone is watching. They make comments like future soccer player, like already a little bruiser, or you're positively glowing. Listen, 
every one of us starts with a bruise. And if I'm glowing, it's just my star collapsing, motherfucker. Not even born, my babe, and already the world stacks narratives around you. We live inside walls every day. I am Lao Wai and Yun Fu on the metro. Neither of us can be invisible anymore. A lady shoots a self selfie with me behind her. I look straight at the camera. I see you. I will be seen seeing being seen. After work on the platform, small screens flicker in the corner of my eye, mimic an approaching train or a tear. The glint of this first utterly untranslatable fact that we begin encircled and end encircling. <clears throat> and the second of these pieces is called A Warmal Day. <clears throat> Government puppet crosses the city to the patriotic office. While the paid IE she daily fails to understand, feeds milk powder to her baby, takes him out to pose for pictures next to the roses and play with the neighborhood boys, their toy guns. Her body flares, then settles. The desk slips into permanence. Suspicion is a journey she'll choose not to take day after day. In the second restroom stall, she learns to avoid the sharp screw ends. Left hand on the wall to steady her tottering squat. At the desk, she learns to avoid exposed sensitivities. Words like trade war and the names of certain powers, man-sized and nation-sized, to avoid certain suggestions and most questions. She begins to learn the language of emojis, is told to avoid the cute llama that may mean fuck your mother. The chair creaks forward, the blue cubicle wall a vertical blanket, a taut and muted flag of some comfort longing country, which is all of them. The door to the office opens only with a key card, the magnetized kind. Doesn't a symbol mean anything anymore? She watches videos of her baby on WeChat sees him take a bath, eat his first dumplings. She balances word equations ringed with mirrors. All this complicit grammar to establish how the sanctioned lid closes, whether it slides or falls, what holds it in, what keeps it out, and what slipped in just before it shut. All right. Um, Next one, titled, What is it about you that happened? I used to have hand, sorry, I used to have hands like houseplants, vaguely diagonal, diagrammatic, used to avoid couplets, tired gestures such as used to, such as. I've learned to compose a miniature universe of gestures, drag and drop, Still, I don't want to fuck it today. Today, I don't feel like fucking anything. I feel like reading maxims and changing. There's a sticky holy book, a beast with a headache, a false wall. I'm watching carefully, all these moving stories. I know wind is a major character and honey is abundant. And some have names, but some are just called what they are. Dysfunctional threads. The only way to keep living is to build an archive. Daily words and fashions, the highest form of revolution. I'm telling against the clock, quiet stories that must matter or what has a life added up to. Untold equals never happened. Like my hands can still play the pathétique, but only when I read the notes. Okay, um, one more piece. Am I okay on time, Francis? Okay, great, just making sure. All right, last one. Um, everything having to do with so many people together. I ache to take a doctor home with me, sit as long as it takes to uncover the full catalog of oddities. Ask this mass here, what is this? This tiny blackness above the muscle, 
the deformation resulting from this motion? Name them. What I mean is to know myself as only someone else can. Show me. What I mean is to be narrated. Someone said, quote, scientific and moral progresses go together, unquote. What I mean is to be with, uh, sorry, is to be drawn within alien frames of reference. Someone said, quote, what is not progressive is not the object of history, unquote. Said, quote, the present is the moment of the grandeur of mankind, unquote. But now we all live in the same time and that's not it. Blood exits to be measured by weight and volume. And even what they call light flow is in fact darker than we imagine. It dries black maroon, like the inside of a mouth in shadow. I too have tried to overcome modern perfection, have praised alien cultural elements and spoken of the rest of the world. Wir sind alle Ausländer does not mean brightness going darker as it evaporates. The blood flows or it flows out, luminous. Very little noise is spilled. It forms a closed system. In other words, access is not the same as ownership. I preserve a Chinese plum inside the globe of my mouth, close my teeth around its black maroon pit like an equator. What it is to live on the outside with no intention of entering. I will not surrender my tongue and the fruit will not surrender its mass to me. That is all. Thank you. Thanks for listening. Thank you. Wow, Jen, thank you so much. Wow, there were so many, it was like line after line. It was just so solid. Um, like moving stories, like people's moving stories. Wow. And yeah, know myself as only someone else can. Those were just a few lines that stuck out to me. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, just wonderful. Robin Smith, you are up. Welcome. Happy to have you. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. And uh, Jen, that was a beautiful reading. I'm, I'm just really honored to be a part of this great group of, of women. So this is fantastic. Um, a little bit about me. I'm originally from Los Angeles, uh, but I came here for uh, my PhD in creative writing at the University of North Dakota. Um, so I'm currently in Grand Forks, North Dakota. Um, my, in order to take a break from my very depressing kind of trauma written heavy uh, dissertation, I started writing um, a collection about queer desire and what it's like to be queer in the rural Midwest, um, especially since Grand Forks is basically like the witness protection program out here. It's so, it's so isolated. Um, and while I was writing it, it kind of became a full length sort of collection and it'll be forthcoming with Rebel Satori Press in uh, later, later this year. I just have to officially sign off on the contract. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, so that's pretty exciting. Um, so I will read a couple of poems uh, from that particular collection. Minor content warning, um, there's a little bit of references to addiction um, and obviously qu queer sex. So those things to, to think about. Okay. All right. Okay, so the first one is called uh, Manic Pixie Dream Girl and it is after Olivia Gatwood. You send your friend an image of me in my yellow parka, drinking a beer at sleds, a wreath of artificial butterflies around my head, my skin aglow. Your friend says, I look like a manic pixie dream girl. You agree and tell him about the time I once put graffiti lines from Neruda around the English department and how the university didn't have the heart to paint over my scrawl, even though all other evidence of vandal was erased immediately. How I was a kleptomaniac of small objects, a silver spoon, a gold sharpie, a voodoo figurine. How I stole a small hoard of books from Keegan's in the cities and was banned from ever drinking there again. How I only listened to the Smiths ironically in a protest against my persona, 
how I wrote poetry almost exclusively on swing sets or in greenhouses during rainstorms, how I get tattoos in a moment's notice because permanent ink is only temporary compared to the longing of the heart how I delight in sending my enemies glitter bombs, the shimmer embedded in the carpet for months to come. You tell me all of this was meant as a compliment. I'm enigmatic and prismatic, the antithesis of boring, an escape from your plain oatmeal life, a kaleidoscope projection on the taupe walls of your office where you quietly read, grade, and sometimes sleep. With me around, your life becomes mythic, you say. But when we visit U of M's bridge, the place where Berryman wrote his penultimate poem, the wind blows my hair in a tempest around my shoulders and you see a small chip in my tooth. You see how my tattoos are purposefully placed to cover tiny scars left by my mother. You see my diamond heart is also Komodo, tongue when cornered. I am no longer a myth. I become real and there is no more rest. You decide against holding my hand while we walk against the wind. Okay. Um, thanks. <laughs> All right. And the second one, a poem from my future wife uh, with found language from my 16 year old diaries. One, your voice is all xylophone and ukulele in the shower. The hot steam and the scent of roses and the rainbows that stream over your body is all I want. And when you step over the tub and tug a pink towel around your small shoulders, I want to push you down onto the bed into clouds of parakeet feathers and magnolias and sum summer shine. Two, I will make us friendship bracelets as if we were still in elementary school. Yellow hearts and tangerine stars and your name with my name. Let's also get matching tattoos on our wrists, little honeybees rare and perfect, charging at the scars who made us. Wear them to the market or don't. If you only wear them while we curl up and watch bad reality TV, I don't care. This love doesn't have to be secret, but if it is and we never return together to our parents and hometowns, that's fine too, babe. Three, it is hard to write a poem for someone I don't know yet but the potential of you, a cello about to be played, double rolled lined paper, a pack of sparkle gel pens, that cherry lipstick pout meant to be smudged with my thumb as they cup your chin and pull you in for a never ending story. I won't be perfect. My messy hair in the morning, eating pop rocks in bed, and my intense emotions and insecurities will glitter storm our apartment sometimes, but I hope you will still love me for it. And I know you can't save me from my own mistakes and depression and dark carousels, but let me dream about you until I do. Four, and the way you listen to my poems and kiss me is the same way you blow out candles with your eyes closed and it is fucking stunning if you only knew how stunning you are and you are a love poem I want to return to again and again a love poem that will break one open over and over again spilling all the hope like so many peony petals geode crystals and pinata candy that we can scoop up in our palms five and if I lose you to someone better than me a prettier woman who knows more poems who makes more money I hope that you'll never forget the way I trace your jawline with my fingers as I tell you I love you more than love. But if I get to keep you, I hope that you'll call me crazy as I sing your cat's baby beluga and pour dish soap into laundromat washers as I swim in Midwest snowfields as I tell you you're the only one I've ever wanted. Okay. Um, and this next one is called, thank you. <laughs> Yellow hearts, uh, this one's a shorter one. I make you come rainbows and I fill my home with red balloons for you. And we play video games beneath the blanket fort I made in the living room. And you put my name in yellow hearts, even though I held you carefully my summer peach and I ate you alive with every love poem I wrote. You couldn't love me the way I needed you to. Yellow hearts, yellow hearts when I left. All right, last one, being queer in a small town, um, alternatively titled Love Sharks. Um, all right, 
I swipe right on a 25 year old because I'm in a small college town and I'm touch starved. And we sit in the spring shine and eat cherry dilly bars from the DQ that rebels against corporate. Her face is rainbow prism because she loves highlighter but hates watching movies and hates reading. She adjusts her daisy nose ring as she thanks me for not being mad that she just wants to play with me like a chemistry kit and that she doesn't really want a girlfriend because she is straight, though she sent me 30 million snaps about her crushing on me, so I don't tell her that I'm exhausted of girls like her who only want to kiss and kiss, drunk on strawberry habanero margs, who blow up my phone when their boyfriends don't text back, who have, I kissed a girl and I liked it as their bumble anthem. I'm tired of swiping left on girls who are 18 and blonde. I want someone my age. I'm tired of having to live on memories of lap dances and French kisses given in violet bloom from women on the dance floor for months while I fuck boys who don't bother to make me feel good. And the dilly bar drips down her shirt and she sucks her finger trying to be cute and I decide then I won't sleep with her. And even though I'm a stranger, she tells me about her boyfriend is always mean to her. And as I drive her home through a sunflower field, she confesses that she hasn't loved anyone since her horse died, alone in a pasture booming with stars and sunflowers like this one. I'm reminded of James Wright and Robert Bly and how James felt the face of a horse and broke into blossom. And as her tears magnify her glitter, and even though I plan on never speaking to her again, I reach for her palm and open waterfall and cradle it in mine until she breaks into magnolia fire, until her face warms, until she slinks fox-like from my Saturn and back to her boyfriend who will forget to tell her she's beautiful and that he loves her before they fall asleep before the moon rises. All right, thank you guys so much. <laughs> thank you, Robin. I love that James Wright poem too. <laughs> thank you so much, Robin. That's beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> you opened up. Um, you opened up my heart on that. I feel like I. Um, I don't know how to say it. I feel like I see things differently from your point of view and I'm just so grateful that you share your poems and your stories with us thank you <laughs> thank you um Emily Bright welcome hello here. thank you Francis I was so glad to do this today so I live in the Twin Cities uh Jen I share in common with you we both have an MFA from the U of M I'm a poet, writer, radio producer. I spent a lot of time writing middle grade historical fiction, but poetry came first. And so it makes me really happy to come back to it tonight. And um, I'll just launch right in. It's called How They Met. I'm being brave or crazy and reading a bunch of new stuff. So let me tell you my pandemic story. No, not that one. I mean, way back the flu that only neutral Spain had the balls to document so during World War and so go got saddled with its name. 1918, people in their prime falling like stars and just as quickly. I don't need to paint that picture primed as we have been for tragedy, except to add the uniforms, smart lines, matching hats creased just so. Picture him small and trim, enlisted in his best hope forward from the orphanage. Picture her, the darling baby of the family, full grown and persuasive, which is to say somehow her parents gave her range to volunteer with the Red Cross. They met in ambulances, ferrying the sick. I wonder if they thought about the risk. I wonder where the lines of duty and compassion met, where duty and bravado why does anyone serve others? Picture an apple shared, a chocolate bar, a taste of gallows humor. At some point, they became more social and less distanced. Her parents bemoaned his upbringing. Still, they pulled it off. The pandemic found its end. I want you to hear that part. They lived, they carved a life together. They produced my grandfather. Think of all the kindnesses that pave our paths, yours and mine. The words of comfort murmur to the sick, 
ambulances that arrived on time, the company within that made the task of healing light. That was a story I learned during the pandemic, the fact that my great grandparents met while they were driving ambulances for the previous pandemic and I'm absolutely fascinated by it. And so um, this was written during a period where we were waiting for the election results. And my husband and I were cheering at record turnout and the assurance of a fair election and watching recounts. And um, I found that all I had space for was writing poetry. And what I kept thinking of was this poem by Richard Wilbur called The Writer, which some of you may know, which I absolutely love, which starts in her room at the prow of the house where light breaks and the windows are tossed with linden. My daughter is writing a story. And that was my starting point for this poem. And uh, this is my version. It's called For Richard, Richard Wilbur. On the floor at the foot of my desk in a spread of folders and math and markers too cluttered for safe passage, my daughter is drawing a dragon. She glances at the picture she will copy from the screen. She turns her pen to claws and wing, the hatch marks near the eyes where realism lies. All this long week, as her father armed his heart against his fears of coup and violence, as I shushed us both with early poles and cupcakes, she has drawn her dragons. She is eight. She hums over her pen. The ridges of the tail align like well-behaved mountains. She knows the grown-ups in her world are nose to news, knows the results matter, but there is room in life for both our larger fate and whether these wings here should be open in mid-flight or closed, whether they will fit within her wide world notebook. I do not speak to her about revision or erasers. When you are eight, every good and big event comes with waiting and a countdown. Each dragon is immediate and therefore perfect. Sometimes it is right to feel unabashed and proud. She drops her pen, her work complete. I do not speak to her of how it is to put our heart's work out into the world where sometimes it is loved and seen and sometimes trod upon. We exclaim, her dad and I, we rave and we mean it. So thank you. So I grew up going to church. And the reason I say that is because it's one of the few places I know where it's possible to know a lot of people, but not actually know their names. I don't know if anyone else has had this experience, especially as a kid and everybody's old and you know all sorts of things about them and who they go with and, and everything and they have full-fledged conversations and you have no idea what their names are. And at some point it's, you're too old to ask. Um, that's the seed. <laughs> I, uh, Francis gets me on this. So that's the seed for this poem based on a real but very different encounter. It's called The Important Parts. And now we've reached the point where I know many things about her, save her name. I've met her autistic son who follows her to work on weekends. He needs somebody to wipe him off, to dress and bathe him at his age, and he only lets mama. How tired it makes her, how devoted. I cry, she says, when distance learning started, I'm tired, but my God is good. She tells me this in bits and phrases as she empties the recycling. We speak a language hodgepodge. Afterward, I can't remember which was said in which. My Spanish, once survival level, now dusty and heavily reliant on grace. Her English, better, but not much. We smile a lot. A smile carries further than you think. I recognize her silhouette across the darkened floor, her black hair and its top bun, earbuds in place as she steers her trash can down the cubicles, creating for everyone a clean slate in the morning. As for her name, of course I asked twice, I think. It didn't stick. And now the moments passed. And then today, a chance encounter, como esta usted as usual, and she said, poco triste. Her husband has no papeles. Entonces, her eyes search mine for understanding. He's been here 20 years, she said, working hard and now immigration's after him. She doesn't know where he is. I barely know the right questions to ask in any language. And oh, her heart 
is breaking. Her son's heart is breaking. The lawyer says there's nothing he can do. I stand with my hand over my heart, wishing I could fix it, but I can't. She speaks, I listen hard. I understand not everything, but the important parts. We hug despite the COVID risk. It's something, it's important, but of course it's not enough. Um, thank you. So this, the or two more poems, um, both part of a collection on early motherhood, um, published a bunch of the individual poems, but not the collection yet. So if there are leads, I'm looking. Um, and this was written when the, the dragon, drawing, dragon drawing daughter was about one. And um, again, written well before the pandemic, but feels, feels uh, appropriate now. It's called At Home. I have invented nothing new today. I have not bled nor bargained. I baked no winning cakes. I have not walked an hour to haul water nor gambled my last dollar. The dogs I don't own aren't unfed. I've spoken no unkindnesses at least. I've had no visionary dreams. And if we've landed on the outer rings of Saturn or witnessed another shooting, God forbid, I have not read reports. I don't plan to remember how I hung the laundry or stooped to re retrieve repeatedly the toys that held my daughter's fascination one minute at a time. Our morning has pulsed steadily to afternoon. I have not taken everything for granted. How after sifting flour, yeast, and water, I lifted my small I lifted her small body to my hip so we could watch the bread machine mix the stuff to sustenance. The dough wobbled and puffed its fine white breath into our faces. I have not saved a life today, nor cost one. Perhaps I should have offered my attention while the dough rose silently and became our bread. So, the thing I love about poetry is that it requires you to slow down and notice. It's a good practice always, but especially in an uncertain world. So last poem here. And uh, I think the one thing to say about that is you can tell a person's age by technology. And all I'll say is that when I started college, I had uh, a desktop with this big heavy monitor and it was on the fourth floor like every year. So. <laughs> Um, it's my last poem. It's called Preparing the Way. And I should say that if you want to find my stuff, my website is emilykbright.com. On the day my parents delivered me to college with everything I thought I'd need, the guitar I could barely play, the books impressive and or loved, my very first computer with its promising squat leaden monitor, my mother insisted on making my bed. I fussed over my dresser while she bent below the top bunk, creasing hospital corners as she'd done a hundred thousand times before. My nurse mother, whose hands taught us how to make the patient comfortable, make the guest feel welcome, keep the child clean and safe. When I was still an act of her imagination, still a swimming, pressing thing, she bought one neutral yellow sheet which she smoothed and smoothed in expectation. Practice, perhaps, for all the midnight sicknesses and accidents, clean bedclothes tucked by rote in darkness. Unfold the sheet, center the crease. I was her helper for a time, which meant I told her knock-knock jokes and later endless questions. And then I was a teenager and edging towards something I could not imagine but wanted desperately. And then we stood sweltering in my tiny fourth floor double while my mother tucked the patchwork quilt she taught me how to sew. She knew that bed might not be made again. She took her time. I was urgent, aimless energy, wanting my parents to leave before my roommate came. This was my remaking. I wanted to spring fully formed, effortlessly cool. 
My new blue towels matched my sheets. The pictures on my desk all pointed back from where I'd come. And then they left. And I sat down on my crisp made bed and stared out on the quad I hoped I would belong to, trying to feel solid and solo and prepared, glimpsing what I'm only just now putting into words. We don't get to know what we're preparing for, not for ourselves, not for our children who hurtle from our bodies onto their palm-sized feet. We pack as best we can. We rise in the midnight hours to give comfort when we would rather sleep, smoothing sheets, tucking covers, building the habits of love. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Emily. Oh my gosh. I have my first, I'm an auntie now and I have not written a poem about my niece and I am so inspired now because it's pretty magical. Mm. I am just, thank you to each one of you truly. It was a great night. Um, I, I think I'll maybe just share, I'll share two poems. Um, so I'm Frances James, um, born and raised in Minnesota. I still live here. Um, I actually just took a little two week, two week vacation with my dog up north. I told no one <laughs> except for my sponsor. And I was like, you know what? I need to just get away. And so I actually, you know, I was having like a thing where I wasn't, I, I was struggling to write and I, man, I wrote probably like 10 poems or more in two weeks. So yeah. Um, so yeah, I, uh, let's see here. So I was on Lake Superior for a couple days and then I went um, to a different part, but um, so I wrote, I love Lake Superior. I mean, I'm Minnesota, like proud all the way. So yeah, all right. This one's called Woman Superior. I watch through my cabin's window, waves 10 feet tall, onward and onward, no resistance, a heroic confidence, an unbreakable strength. The sea that is Lake Superior is female. I know this because she doesn't wince or cower as she smashes into shoreline rocks. I wonder how long she has been so mighty. I can only assume for what seems like forever. My life is like this. I've lived a thousand lifetimes in 34 years. Um, okay, let's see here. Um, all right, this one's called The Plot. I'm halfway here and writing this. I'm only partly close to pain. I'm gone, but nearby. I'm listening to myself from another room. I can't go any further. I also can't turn around. I only know where I am is not with you. I think this is faith, but no one says you could be wrong. No one wants to believe in choices when destiny feels prettier than risk or strength is more acceptable than innocence. I'd like this story to end well. I'd like to know it was worth it for both of us. But all I know is who I'm becoming isn't who I was. All I know is who I think you are and the plot isn't finished. Um, you know what, I'll read one more. Yeah, it was like, I wrote about so many different things. It's just, it was kind of fun to just, there was a lot going on. Um, I'll end on a horse poem since we were talking about horses earlier. I can't even, I can't even tell you how much I love horses. Like, oh, okay. This one is called Horses Everything. Horses Everything. Running on all fours, neighing and galloping, a strand of string for reins. Perhaps I'll try to tame the wild, magnificent Catherine as I put heel to my sister's ribs to canter us around the living room. I sit upon a saddle we constructed carefully without rush, complete with stirrups and a blanket too. 
I'm on Black Beauty or the Black Stallion, racing next to my window as I ride in my mother's minivan, clearing jumps over fences, street signs, even a building, as I hold on to mane and hug legs to bare back. Sometimes I hold on so tight, we run ahead faster than cars. At Alicia's, we spend all night building castles for our toy horses. From the closet full of VHSs, we stack and stack. Nightmare on Elm Street becomes a wall. E.T. becomes a door. The Terminator is part of a roof on the second level. No palace is high enough for the royal ponies. Near my birthday, holidays, or the chance of a trip to the toy store in Wyzetta, I imagine all the kinds of brayer horses there could be. A rearing Appaloosa, a feeding Frisian mare and colt. I don't want Barbies, I don't want dolls, just everything horses. Stuffed animal Palomino, a ceramic paint that has the best spot on my shelf, thoroughbred books, equestrian magazines, a giant poster of a filly, Lisa Frank folders of unicorns and Pegasus, and a 250 sticker booklet that just still isn't enough. But above all, a personal favorite, a second and first place ribbon from fun days at the Briscoe Arena pinned to my bedroom corkboard for all to see. Beside a photo of me with the Matson's Bay Horse Snickers and a grin the size of a hundred horses dreaming peacefully. <laughs> all right, well, thank you so much for being here. Um, you can check out um, my work. I post most of it to Facebook. I have a blog that I need to add more to as well. But um, I go under Franz Art from the Heart. That's kind of my name. I post my photography, music, everything there. But please, uh, Robin, Jen, and Emily, um, in the comments under the video, please also include any publications or your upcoming books. Um, thank you so much for being here. It was a really great night. And I hope everyone has a great rest of their Sunday. And I hope to see you ladies here again. So thank, thank you, you, Francis. Such a treat. Yes, thank you guys so much. This is lovely. <laughs> Thanks. Good night. Have a good night.